Welcome to everyone and thank you all for joining us for this uh, Bronco wellness chat and I'll introduce myself too. I'm Carolyn Smith. I am assistant director of alumni relations and a lot of you know Hardy. He finally has a team so we're very excited about that um, but we welcome you all to this chat and before we jump into things um, we are going to record this, so I just started doing that. So I'll ask that you all just put yourselves on mute for right now and probably go ahead and put your videos on mute for now too so that we can get a good recording. But we will certainly invite you back to um, interact and ask questions and that kind of thing. And if anyone has questions that they want to put into the chat, Todd and I will be watching that as well. Um, I also, I will add because our last session, I felt we needed to say this. So we just wanna let you know that the information here today is for general guidance and educational purposes. And we don't want you to construe it as individual advice, which you might get instead from a, your own financial advisor. So um, with that, we are excited to partner with the Sanford Center for Financial Planning and Wellness and program manager Todd Mora has generously volunteered to lead these sessions so that I can learn alongside all of you. Um, and our alumni expert for today, thanks to Eric Tiller, who is currently the Vice President for Investments and Financial Advisor for Raymond James and Associates in, here in Kalamazoo. And prior to joining Raymond James, he worked as a financial advisor for A.G. Edwards, Wachovia, Wells Fargo um, for four years and spent over seven years as a portfolio manager and research analyst with Greenleaf Trust. But we also know that he is a proud supporter of Broncos and Bronco athletics. So we are excited to have you here, Eric, and thank you so much for joining us. He's already given me homework, which I will send to all of you um, after the session today. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Todd so that I can take some notes. Um, but Todd, before you start asking questions, um, Todd's the program manager for the Sanford Center. So if you could just tell everyone who maybe wasn't here for last week's session a little bit about the Sanford Center and what services you provide for students and the community. Yep. Thank you, Carolyn. More than happy to. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Um, as Carolyn said, I'm the program manager for the Sanford Center. And here at the Sanford Center, we have a couple of major focus uh, foci. Uh, one is uh, promoting financial literacy amongst students here at Western and in, in helping them uh, understand personal finance better and to, to be able to use that in their life to uh, maybe start off on the right foot and maybe avoid some of the pitfalls we've all made as far as uh, uh, previous uh, decisions financially. Second is we promote financial literacy in the greater Kalamazoo community through a variety of partnerships and initiatives that uh, involve high school students and um, the uh, education of those students. Um, and then the third big focus of the, of the Sanford Center is to help promote financial planning as a career choice for students here at Western. Um, <clears throat> Todd Sanford, uh, the benefactor for the center, uh, is, is a big proponent in financial planning and helping people, uh, you know, gain wealth and, and freedom through, through that financial planning. And he believes it's a, it's a great career choice, which it is, and he wants to help promote that. So, uh, we are here to help, and so if you have a student or somebody who you think uh, could benefit from information or assistance, we are more than happy. Feel free to contact them. We'll, and all of our services are free of charge, obviously. So with that, I um, want to welcome Eric, uh, and I thought maybe we'd start off with, uh, you know, every time something big happens, there's always a teachable moment. And so I guess I'm curious, what should we have learned or what can we learn from 2020? I thank you, and I want to thank you and Carolyn for uh, hosting this today so that we can uh, help some fellow Bronco alumni and uh, students and those of uh, us that are friends of the university. So um, I think, you know, there has been a lot of teachable moments, and especially with GameStop 
being in the headlines, it's created a lot of uh, chatter in the newspaper, uh, on TV, and with students. Um, I've got a couple of students, a, a sophomore at Western, and my son is a sophomore in high school, and they've been asking me, hey, what's this, uh, what's this GameStop thing? So it creates a conversation, which I think is good for investing, and it's going to teach us all a lot. And I think it's taught us that we really want to decipher if we're investors or some of those day traders that are pushing uh, these, these small stocks up. So, you know, you really want to look at investing through a lens of long term instead of it being a sprint. It's really a marathon. And I think too often uh, it's how can I make money fast? And building wealth occurs over time. And just to show my age, when I graduated back in 98 from the College of Business, there was no financial planning degree. You couldn't go to the HCOB and get a, a personal financial designation uh, or major. So I, I, I had to uh, take what was there at the time, finance. So, um, you know, the, the students today have financial planning through the Sanford Center. It's a huge opportunity. Well, thank you. So you mentioned about uh, the uh, peak or the um, GameStop issue. One of the things I think about um, is about a year ago, uh, we would we would I think there was a fairly sizable drop in the market. And you talk about long term, you know, uh, horizon or viewpoint. Um, I was wondering if maybe that you might talk a little bit about uh, how people should look at events like that and, and manage that in, from a long-term perspective. Sure, and I think that I can answer some of these questions with pictures. They always say a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm gonna share my screen here and with some of these great questions that have come to us beforehand that you're bringing up today, uh, I wanna to touch on some of these. I'm gonna to get to that long-term question. I wanna start with a little bit of encouragement to our students that are with us, also alumni. I think this is a great slide. Being a Bronco, as most of us are, and having an education, I really think this is one of the keys to setting you up for long-term success, whether that's financial success uh, or in your career success. This chart here on your left really shows your unemployment rate by education level. You're going to notice that this gray scale, the college or, uh, or greater or some college, you're going to notice these lines during the pandemic were some of the lowest. And over time, having more education is always helpful. Let's turn that into dollars for a second. If you go to the right side of the screen here, you're going to notice that a high school graduate is going to make about $40,000 a year and you go to a bachelor's degree and even an advanced degree, you're really looking at many more dollars with that education. So I wanna, I wanna kind of preface our conversation. I wanna encourage those students that are with us today. Um, and I can always share these slides later, but I think this is a good uh, jumping off point. To answer your question directly, Todd, about long-term investing, I'm gonna go to uh, slide 71 here. This is a chart that shows stocks in green, bonds in blue, and a 50-50 portfolio of half stocks and half bonds. You're gonna notice this long-term average uh, over the last 20 years, stocks have returned about 11, bonds six, and if you had a 50-50 portfolio, about 9%. If you look down across the bottom here, just starting on the left, these are the periods of time that we measure over one, five, 10 and 20 year periods, you can see that anything can happen within one year, which is really to, to speak about the last year we've all lived through, right? The S&P was down 34% at one point. Since 1950, it actually was down 39% in one year. That's probably back in the financial crisis. 
Bonds, you're going to notice the variance or the spread is not as much. And if you have half your money in bonds, half in stocks, it's even more compact. And again, if you go out over 5, 10, or 20 years, you're going to notice a 50-50 portfolio over 5, 10, 15 years has never experienced a negative decline. So this is what I, I'm talking about when we think long-term, is that we long-term is not one day, one week, one month, one year. To me, long-term is really looking at five years plus. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so has anything changed about the way we should be investing and planning for retirement? You know, I don't think it has. Um, I think that most people, um, if we, in all of us, alumni and current students, if we can really keep things simple, and when I say simple, um, Raymond James has a good piece, and it's, it's resolutions. Um, can you see the, that on my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, I'm just going to hit on two of these, and these are just long-term, uh, let's get it right first. I think if, if all of us could go back in time, there's a couple things we probably all do differently with our finances. I think number one is really to have a plan. Most of us start out without much of a plan, and then after a few trials and tribulations, uh, we, we get smart. And I think number one is get a balance sheet in order. So today, after, after this event, um, and even during our time today, I'm going to share with you just a, a short balance sheet, if you will, a net worth statement that I think is important to uh, just take a measurement of where you're at currently. And then number two is to really have a budget. I remember when I was a student, you know, you have a little part-time job and it seems like it's so much easier to spend than it is to make it. And uh, my wife and I were talking last night to our daughter about building some of those topics that Kelly talked about last week during our wellness chat, building credit, uh, having a budget and uh, building your net worth statement so that you have a plan of attack. Uh, I think those are two key things uh, that most of us, if we just started earlier, if we start a discipline that, that really compounds over time. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so looking going forward, you know, there's, there's hope on the future as far as with uh, vaccines and other things. Are there things we should be looking at uh, doing for 2021? Yeah, I think uh, there, was, there was a question that was brought up um, and we just, uh, Raymond James, just, we had our uh, 10 themes for 2021. One of those questions was on uh, ethical, environmental, uh, social and uh, corporate governance issues. So this slide is very busy, but if you just, um, I'm gonna go back one here. The wave of investing in, in, in socially responsible and environmentally responsible ways is really growing. I think that's one big uh, thing in investing right now. You can see here just on these bar charts uh, from 2018 to the end of last year, ESG investing was up 42%. And since 2005, sustainable investing is up almost tenfold. And even some of the borrowing that companies are doing is reflective of that. Socially uh, sustainable bonds, green loans. And this is a huge uh, uh, topic. And uh, this slide, I won't go through it, but these are kind of five reasons that that wave of ESG investing is, is not gonna stop. Uh, companies are being more socially responsible. And um, we've only got, one, one world, and uh, we need to make sure that uh, we're taking care of it. All right, thank you. Uh, what are some 
investing tips for those participants who might not closely follow the market. So, you know, if, if you're not going to be somebody who is going to set up those alerts and you're, you know, not uh, checking uh, your Bloomberg at home, uh, what, what types of things might you recommend for people? Sure. Um, I think one of the keys is that you really want to be diversified. And I think a lot of uh, younger investors, shall we say, are not diversified enough. So we tend to put all our eggs in one basket. And this chart really speaks to being diversified. So we call this a quilt chart, and you're going to notice that uh, this asset allocation, which is a diversified portfolio from 2006 to 2020, if you're diversified, you average 6.7%. And you're going to notice from 2005 on the left of your screen all the way down to 2020, if you just were diversified, you can see kind of this smoother roller coaster ride that you would have went on. And again, you would have averaged about 7% over time. Now, if we look back at the early 2000s, international emerging market stocks were up here towards the top. And then you'll notice uh, kind of the uh, 2011 through uh, 2016, you'll notice that emerging market stocks and European stocks were down towards the bottom. So if you put all your eggs in one of those baskets and you're always chasing the hot investment, whether that be Tesla, GameStop, whatever stock it might be, the best advice I can give a lot of students uh, or alumni is to be diversified, know if you're a saver or an investor, because some of us aren't, we don't wanna take risks, we're more of a saver. But if we're an investor and we're a growth investor, just by a good growth mutual fund. Uh, if, you're, if you're more of a balanced investor, more of a, re a retiree, or you're within five years of retirement, I think you wanna have more of a balanced approach, you know, half bonds, half stocks. Um, and that's again, something that a financial advisor can help you with, but being diversified, not putting all in your eggs in one basket, thinking long-term, I think those all make sense. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, the uh, people who registered, they sent in some questions ahead of time, which we really appreciate. Uh, and I'll uh, just want to share a couple of those with you right now. What percentage of the net worth should be allocated to personal real estate? Great question. And that was one that um, I had to do a little digging on last week. So I'm going to share with you here uh, a financial statement. And this is what I use with clients. And uh, it's just a good old fashioned spreadsheet that I've customized. And, you know, when we're, when we're looking at our spending, and this is a balance sheet uh, or a net worth statement, personal financial statement. So if I go down here and I look at a pie chart of, of where we can put our, our assets, uh, cash, bonds, stocks, real estate, I think we really want to start with our income and again, kind of going back to a budget, especially if I would have given myself advice going back to when I was in college, is looking at what you make and what you spend. And I think too, too many times as Americans, we spend more than we make. And uh, we get ourselves in credit card debt, we buy too big of houses. So to answer the, the real estate question, I think you need to go back and look and say, okay, if I make $50,000 a year, $6,000 a month, after taxes, that's $5,000, how much of that $5,000 monthly net income is going to go towards uh, my real estate? And I think you need, there's no magic number or percentage. It's different for everybody, right? Right. So if I just came out of Western with my four-year degree and I'm making 50 grand, I shouldn't go out and buy a $500,000 house. However, if I'm uh, a Bronco alumni that's 50 years old, I'm into my career, um, my 401k is growing, I'm saving, uh, I'm getting close to debt-free, 
then you can probably go out and buy a $250,000 to $500,000 house. So as a percentage of your net worth, how much you have in cash, investments, uh, pre-tax and after-tax, it's all going to depend on what chapter of life each one of us is in. But they say overall, rough, rough numbers, you don't want to spend more than 25 to 30% of your monthly income on housing. Okay, great. Um, got a question from the chat and the person was asking, uh, they currently have a um, portfolio with, and I'm not going to use the company, but with a um, company, the national type uh, brokerage firm. Um, and the question is really, what are the benefits of having a local firm handle my account versus uh, maybe having, uh, you know, an online or uh, uh, a company that only has an online presence and, you know, specifically related to the costs and then the, uh, maybe the personal touch that you would receive. Uh, so it, maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, the different platforms that people are able to invest through and maybe some of the pros and cons. Sure. I think uh, each of us as investors, uh, we're, we're comfortable. We're all different, right? Once again, there's not a one size fits all. So when you're thinking about investing and working with uh, a personal financial advisor or a banker, you have to do what works for you. So a lot of uh, my client niche is with retirees and retirees really want to see you face to face. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm licensed in 12 states and Zoom has really um, uh, let me be in front of face to face with some of my out of state clients. And I do try to go and see them every couple of years face to face uh, pre pandemic. Um, but I think it's different for each person. So if a, if a face to face meeting is really important, then I think you need to have one of a local advisor. But again, a relationship is all based on trust. And you've got to go with somebody you trust. And it's about service for cost, right? Um, all of us uh, have jobs. We've got to make a living. But I think um, knowing the service level that you're going to receive from your advisor, uh, how many times are we going to talk during the year, have an in-person meeting, a Zoom meeting, uh, a conference call, check-in, if you will, and um, what you're going to be um, paying for that service because our industry has moved more towards a advisory fee-based platform that maybe you pay a uh, you know 1% for annual investing where your advisor is really um, going to be managing for that percentage. But if you're going to be a buy and hold person and you're just going to hold striker or you're just going to buy and hold a, a, a group of stocks or individual bonds and you're not going to change it much, I don't think you need to be in a fee-based advisory relationship. So again, this is something that you need to sit down with an advisor, interview a couple, and uh, really make sure that your expectations are going to be met up front. Thank you. Um, so another question that from one of the, the pre-registered uh, submissions is, is a Roth IRA still a good idea? If so, where do I go to start one? I think a Roth IRA is a fantastic uh, idea, especially for uh, students just starting out. So a Roth IRA is made with contributions that are already that have already been taxed. So let's just say you have a job, you get paid, and that pay has obviously come through. You paid federal and state taxes. Then you invest that money into a Roth IRA. That money, let's say that $10,000 grows to $50,000 over the years. When you take that money out, when you're 59 and a half or older, you got to be 59 and a half or older, when that money comes out, there's no taxes due. So I think a Roth IRA is a great thing if, if you have a number of years to invest because I believe taxes are going to go up. Federal and state taxes are going to go up over time. So with a Roth, you've, you're paying your taxes now. And when that money comes out someday, it won't matter what the tax rate is. 
uh, versus a traditional IRA or a 401k where your money is pre-tax, it goes in before taxes are taken out. A traditional IRA or a 401k, when that money comes out someday, it's gonna be taxed because it wasn't taxed on the way into the account. So again, I think a Roth IRA is one of your first spots to start to being a long-term investor along with your employer-sponsored plan. Um, yeah, so just a quick follow-up. Um, so not only can somebody who is employed do a Roth IRA, my understanding is you could set one up for a minor child if they have earned income. Is that correct? Correct. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so the custodial Roth IRA, and, I've heard, is, is, a, is something, if you're able to do it, is, is quite beneficial because you're starting so early. Yeah, we were just having this conversation with uh, our son. Uh, he says, I need to get a job, and he's in high school, and uh, I've tried to get him involved in investing. So we're doing a little uh, family stock game. So we each picked four uh, companies, and uh, we're going to have a little fun with it over the year. But um, yes, it's a great way to, you know, with uh, the GameStop frenzy and Tesla and Robinhood accounts and all this, it's a good way for the younger generation to get introduced to investing. But your point is well made, Todd, that you've got to have uh, earned income. So it can't be that a parent starts a Roth IRA and puts in $6,000, which is the max if you're under 50, and funds it with the parent's money. It has to be earned income from the child. So if the child only makes five grand, you can't put in six. So again, it, it's the honor system. It's our, it's our wonderful tax code. But I think uh, it's, it's a great way that, uh, that our young people can start investing, start getting a statement in the mail and looking at it and over time, you know, building their, building their wealth. Okay, so here's a, here's a great question for uh, quite a few people um, that was sent in. What are your thoughts on investing HSA dollars or health savings account dollars? Yeah, I, um, I really think you need to be careful there. So uh, in HSA, I'll just use myself as an example. So I'm mid forties, uh, married, two children, my HSA, I am not investing in the market, even though I'm an advisor, because we need that money through the year. We need it for doctor visits, uh, co-pays, we need it for prescriptions along the way, uh, braces are thankfully over, but all of those different costs that you may incur during the year where you can use your health savings account, you gotta have that money available. And if I invest that HSA and all of a sudden we have a pandemic, and you lose a third of that account because the market goes down by a third. So all of a sudden your, your $9,000 goes down uh, to six grand and you have expenses during the year, you're gonna be uh, an unhappy camper. Whereas I think if you're an older adult and you can build up your HSA over the year years, because HSAs you can build up over time, year over year. So let's say you have a retiree that's 70 years old and the HSA that you're able to put approximately $6,500, $6,600 a year in, you put your money in all those years and you don't use it every year because now your kids are out of the house. It's just maybe you and a significant other. You can invest some of that money. I wouldn't invest it all in growth funds, but maybe some income funds or balanced funds that you can try to make a little bit of a return, grow that money conservatively, and you're knowing that you're in a, at an older age and you're not going to need all that money right away. Uh, but I would be careful because first you want it to be for health care and it really needs to be, you know, secondarily an investment account. Good advice. Thank you very much. Um, so what advice do you have for somebody who is interested in buying uh, bond mutual funds? Um, and the question is, is uh, couched with the um, kind of the add-on of they'd like, the person would like to achieve better interest rates, but has questions about the fluctuation in value. Sure. 
So let's go to a slide on interest rates and bonds. So I don't want, um, I want to just kind of look at the bottom of, of slide 77. So, you know, really since March of last year when the pandemic was hitting the hardest, the Federal Reserve has pushed interest rates down very low to uh, entice people to, you know, refinance their mortgages, uh, purchase cars, uh, spend money, if you will. That pushing down of interest rates has pushed bond yields really low. So if you look at the chart down here in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, fixed income, a 10-year treasury is paying about 90 basis points. That's now up to about 1.15%. So remember, if you buy a 10-year treasury, you're going to own it for 10 years, and you're going to get paid about 1% right now. So to me, if you're a bond investor, you're, you're more conservative, right? You want more preservation of principle with a little bit of income. So if we take a little bit more risk, U.S. aggregate bonds or corporate bonds are paying a little bit more, maybe 1.1%. And then as we go down here uh, and we look at high yield bonds, also called junk bonds, high yield junk bonds are paying about 4% right now and emerging market bonds are paying four and a half. So I think you, you, know, you look at the scale uh, on the right, you're very conservative, government bonds, corporate bonds, high quality corporate bonds. And as you move down the risk spectru spectrum, your high yield junk bonds and emerging market debt, you can get more of a yield, uh, but you're definitely taking more risk. So. You know, bond investing is really difficult right now just because of interest rates being so low. So, um, you know, I'm more of the camp. If somebody can take a little bit more risk and they can invest in a good balanced mutual fund, I think that would be the spot. That, that would be my opinion is if we look down here, a 60-40 portfolio or a 40-60 uh, 60 or 40% is the amount you would have in stocks and 40% or 60% is the amount you have in bonds. So if you can take a longer term view, this is over the last 20 years, a balanced portfolio has gotten you about 5% where bonds have gotten you, you know, right here it's showing 5%, but with interest rates so low, you're gonna be lucky if you can outpace the return on cash or inflation at one 1.7 to 2.2%. So it's a tough environment for bonds. I think if somebody can take a little bit more risk, uh, they should look at buying a balanced mutual fund. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, so somebody uh, asked the question, it's kind of a good follow-up, and they said, well, how do I get started investing in the bond market, which might be different than if you were looking at bond mutual funds, correct? Correct, correct. So if you want to own individual bonds, you know, we always uh, hear about individual investors, day traders opening up uh, an online account, an E-Trade account, a Schwab account, a Robinhood account, and buying stocks. You can also open up an online account and you can buy individual bonds. And buying individual bonds, as opposed to buying a bond mutual fund, is something you need to be careful with because you don't want to pay over par or much over par. So if we think of a thousand dollar bond, we're going to have to pay a little bit in a commission to buy a bond, but we don't want to pay a huge premium to buy that bond. So, you know, if you open up an online account, most brokerage firms, you can work with a professional that's on a desk a bond desk and they'll help you buy a bond. So if you want to buy a real conservative bond that's maybe yielding three, three and a half percent, think of the Coca-Cola company. You can buy a Coke bond where you're going to get maybe, uh, you know, three, three percent, three and a half percent versus, uh, you know, a treasury bond where again, maybe you're only going to get around one percent a year. So there, there is 
such thing as individual bonds. You just need to have a little bit of uh, expertise or help doing that. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, the question from the chat, uh, the person says, my company allows me to do contributions both to an IRA, uh, both IRA and Roth. Is there any reason I should do both or should I do all Roth? And then they add, I'm 37. So. That's a great question. So I'm gonna share my screen here again. I'm gonna go back to the uh, balance sheet that I created for uh, John or Jane Bronco here. So um, an employer 401k. So let's just use an example here of somebody that can put money away in a 401k pre-tax. Let's say they start with $400 and annually they put away $4,000. Let's say somebody's 22 today. Um, well, their, their full retirement age for social security is gonna be around 67. So let's just say that they've got another 45 years so if you put four grand away for 45 years and you just get a 7% annual return, that's going to leave you with a little over a million dollars. So again, it's starting early, as early as we can as is, is, uh, students coming out of college um, or teaching this to our, our, our kids and young people. But then his uh, second part of his question was a Roth. So with a Roth, you have limits uh, under... 50, your limit is $6,000 a year. And if you're 50 or over, you can put an additional thousand in for a total of seven. But uh, your 401k is pre-tax and your 401k, uh, your, your maximum is 19,500 if you're under 50. So you're able to put more away into your 401k. And then once you turn 50, you can put an additional 6,500 away for a total of 26,000 a year of your own money. So I like the question. So for a 37 year old, I think you uh, put a mu as much away in your 401k to get the match. Cause usually there's a match uh, from the company that you work for. So do the minimum to get the maximum match. But then I like the idea of also having a Roth if you don't make too much money, because remember, if you make too much money, you can't do a Roth. But if you can do a Roth and you save money into that Roth over the years, when you get ready to retire, you're going to have money in two different buckets. You're going to have pre-tax money from the 401k, and you're going to have money that you can uh, maybe take out later and let continue to grow the Roth. Because remember, there's no required minimum distribution on a Roth. So I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but your, your 401k, when you retire and you leave your employer, that money will get rolled into a traditional IRA. And you have to start taking that money out at 72, age 72. It's called the required minimum distribution. So you've got to start taking it out by 72. A Roth IRA, on the other hand, there's no required minimum distribution and you can take that money out after age 72 if you wanna let it continue to grow. But the key thing to keep in mind is this is all long-term money. You need to put the money in there with the thought of, I cannot get to it until I'm 59 and a half. That's the stipulation for all these accounts unless there's a few hardship, you know, hardships where you can get into those accounts. But I won't go into that, but I like um, this person's question because you got a pre-tax bucket of money and you've got an after-tax bucket of retirement money. Yeah, so just as, a, as kind of a, a little follow-up on this, so if people think about it as a little bit of layering, so maybe that first layer is the 401k up to your employer match, the next layer would then be the Roth IRA up to whatever maximum you're allowed based on age or income. And then maybe going back and completing your 401k up to whatever your total uh, limit is, as far as if you can. So, okay, that uh, that kind of is one way I've, I've thought about it about it in the past. Absolutely. Okay. 
Um, let's see. I don't, okay, we don't have any more questions in the chat. If people have questions, feel free to throw those in the chat. I did want to, uh, just as a general, not knowing, um, you know, the, what our audience is today, but I did want to ask you a little bit about maybe if you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the power of compounding because uh, financial research has shown that a lot of people, uh, that's a concept or a, an idea that is hard for people to get their head around, but it's so important relative to investing and understanding how you really build wealth. So maybe if you want to talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. So I'm going to go back to my old uh, steady financial statement here. And I think one thing you want to keep in mind is they asked Einstein, what's the most amazing thing you've learned over time? And Einstein said compounding, making money on your money's money over time creates wealth. So if you think of uh, GameStop and all the stuff that's been in the headlines, these are really, this is day trading, right? This is not long-term investing. So uh, if we think of long-term investing and compounding, let's just say we had an IRA, a traditional IRA, and we started with zero and we just were, were uh, 49 or under and we just put $6,000 away. And let's say we do it for 20 years, okay? So I changed my number of years up here to 20, six grand a year, and I'm using a 7% average rate of return. You're, you're investing in a growth mutual fund. So somebody over 20 years investing $6,000 annually is going to have about $250,000. Well, what if they are over 50 and they can put seven grand away? It bumps it up a little bit. But then let's go back and tell our kids, well, let's start right after you graduate from Western and you walk off that stage. And let's just say you invest for 40 years and we'll mix it up. We'll kind of go in the middle to 6,500. So again, we have zero today. We put 6,500 away for 40 years, 7% annual compounding return. You'd have just shy of 1.3 million. But again, somebody that, that waits and they only have, they say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna retire in 10 years and now I'm gonna max out my 401k. I'm gonna put $26,000 away for 10 years. They're only gonna have 350,000. It's really starting early. So that's why I say if we can teach our households, our, our, our younger folks, but even if we're a little older now and we're 40s, 50s, it's not too late. And if we can start with a budget at the beginning of every year, and that's why I love what Kelly said last week, start with a budget. Really see if you can invest because you need to see if you're living within your means first. If you got credit card debt and a car loan and you got rent, you really need to pay off those high interest credit cards and be able to be an investor. But you got to be, you know, I, I think the only debt you should have over time is school loans if you're a young person and a mortgage. Really, if you can, if you can be debt free by the time you retire uh, and have a good lump, a good, a good nest egg, I think that's this, um, you know, it makes life a lot easier, right, when we live within our means. Well, uh, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple more questions in the chat. And, and I, I think uh, we're, the uh, chat questions are getting uh, more sophisticated and they're quite good. So here's one. So the person says, I've already utilizing my full employer 401k match. What are the advantages of contributing more to my 401k versus another type of investment account? Say they set up a, you know, a, a, uh, a taxable investment account or... You know, that uh, something like that. So, um, and we've got a couple more. So after that, if you answer that. Yeah, so let's let's hit that kind of head on. So on, on this uh, personal balance sheet that I, I would love for, uh, especially of our, our, our younger students to build, 
Um, up here, this is all pre-tax, right? What, all the stuff we've covered so far is Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs, uh, our employer 401ks. But down here at the bottom of the financial statement, you'll notice after-tax assets. So again, I would really want to make sure that I'm in control of my monthly expenses, auto loans, credit cards, mortgages, home equity loans, if you already own a home. I would really want to make sure that I'm, I'm debt-free or I'm paying the, the minimum of all those, don't have any credit cards. Um, you know, we, we all need somewhere to live. So if you got a mortgage, I think that's okay. And a car loan. But if you're, if you're maxing out your 401k um, and, you know, your, your, your Roth, I think I would first go to making sure we have an emergency fund. Most people in America do not have an emergency fund. So if the car breaks, the furnace breaks, there's an emergency, a health emergency, we all need to have six to 12 months of living expenses up in our savings and checking. I think that's first. If you've got money in savings and checking, you're putting in your pre-tax accounts, you're in control of your debt, any debt that you have, that's when I think, that's when you look at an after-tax account where you have a joint account or a single, uh, single name investment account. If after you've checked the other three boxes, you still have extra money and you can afford to invest it, that's when I said you have an after-tax account, joint account, trust account, TOD, transfer on death account. I think that's good, but you just wanna make sure that, again, you've got plenty of cash, you're in control of your, of your debt, but that you're maxing out either your Roth or your 401k or both. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, so this question came in, which is I, uh, something that, you know, I, I think everyone could apply to anyone. Um, how do you transfer your retirement plan from one employer to another or do a rollover? Yeah, so that's a pretty simple process. And again, that's kind of uh, what I built my business on over the last 22 years is, is working with uh, executives and, and retirees. So it's a simple process. Uh, you need to have a traditional IRA uh, or Roth IRA set up at a bank, at a brokerage firm. Um, but typically what you'll do is once you have that set up, uh, you'll work with a financial professional or Sometimes people do it on their own. If they're uh, financially savvy, they manage their own assets. But typically, once you've got that account set up outside of your employer, you'll call the custodian, whoever, wherever the plan is custodied. So a lot of 401ks are at Vanguard, Fidelity, TIAA, um, you know, wherever the assets are custodied, you'll call the number on your statement and you'll uh, ask them, uh, you'll tell me you want to do a rollover. And there will either be forms or uh, questions that you can go through over, uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes over the phone to roll over those uh, proceeds in a 401k into a traditional IRA outside of uh, your employer-sponsored plan. So it's a very simple process. It's a tax-free process. And... Um, it's pretty pretty seamless. You just want to make sure that you get it right, and uh, you don't take a check outside of a qualified plan so that you're taxed on it. But uh, it, it's a simple, straightforward plan. Okay. And as a quick follow up, somebody just popped into the chat. Is it is there any downside to leaving your four hundred one k at your previous employer? Um, I would say there's a few. Uh, downsides, but there's there's also positives. So if your plan has good investment options and you don't have a relationship with an advisor, you don't want to do the investing yourself and you've done well over the years and you want to leave it there, uh, you can. Um, sometimes a company will make you roll it out, but if they don't, you can leave it there. But usually on the menu, there's 10 to 15 different mutual funds. So you're more limited in the amount of investment choices you have in the plan. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's still maybe not as much in your control. You know, if, if it's at a, uh, uh, a brokerage firm or online and you're working with a professional, 
I think, especially when you go through difficult times in the market, uh, I, I can speak for some of my clients that, you know, behavioral finance is a very big thing. And I do a lot of um, handholding, talking to clients and just getting them to remember to think long-term that every year on average, the market goes down 14%, right? It's, it's gonna bounce up and down. But if you can just stay consistent with your objective and your risk tolerance, um, I think that's the biggest reason is why you would work with a professional on your nest egg is that uh, that's all that that financial professional does is manage money. So it's, it'd be like me trying to, to uh, you know, fix my car. I'm not, I'm not a mechanic. I'm not that smart. Well, yeah. Um, a quick, uh, good question here regarding um, two different types of retirement planning. So the person asked, if my spouse has a pension through her employer, should I change my investment strategy uh, and move more towards savings or still shoot for 15 to 20% of, for my 401k? So thinking a little bit about, you know, if, they're, if their spouse has a, a pension, should they be reducing the amount they're putting in their 401k or should they be thinking about different strategies re related to that? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I sit down with my clients, I always like to have um, both spouses involved, both significant others involved, because it's really important to make sure that you're on the same page as far as those long-term goals. Um, I think it's important to say, when do we want to retire as a couple? My, my, my wife has a pension and, uh, you know, maybe I can pull back. Um, maybe I can, uh, instead of more going into my 401k, I can pay off our mortgage quicker or uh, kids' student loans or helping with college. I think it just takes sitting down, taking out a blank piece of paper and really chronologically going through the years and doing some planning to look and say, where are we going to need major cash flow during the years? What can we average with our investments and taking into account the pension? So I think that's where you, uh, you know, would, would want a professional where you can really do some financial planning and uh, goal planning. Okay, um, just checking the chat here to see if we have any other questions. We don't. One, one thing that you, you mentioned or alluded to at the beginning was is some of the recent activity as far as um, with GameStop and Bed Bath and & Beyond and some other things. And so my, my, I guess one question I would have is uh, a lot of young people uh, have, have downloaded and started using the Robinhood app. And for maybe some people in the group today, maybe their parents and they have uh, students who are maybe college age or something like that. Um, what advice would you give them about how to talk to their children about some of the financial apps that out there, out there that actually almost present uh, investing or quote unquote investing, but they gamify it. That's the thing I've heard about Robinhood is they, they tried to gamify this and they got people into maybe things that they didn't know that they were getting into. Yeah, and I, and I would say, you know, uh, this is a, it's a tough discussion in some ways because I think social media and uh, we're all, all of us are guilty to be being connected to our phones. And now so much there's, you know, uh, online gambling and uh, sports gambling is, is now legal. So uh, I, I think that the term gamify and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, kids are into video games. You know, I think it's a double-edged sword. I, I think it can be a good teaching moment to have an investment account, whether it's through Robinhood or Schwab or Raymond James. Uh, and, and we have some, have a couple of companies or stocks that we watch, right? We can watch them on our phone. It's a good teaching moment. It can build wealth, but it, it, it needs to not, it, it needs to be looked at as investing, right? And investing is a marathon, uh, not a sprint. So thinking long-term and if you want to say, hey, we're going to pick a couple of stocks that are more short-term, but I think we, uh, keeping it simple and having a good growth mutual fund, uh, 
I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we just, we need to think about investing as investing, building wealth over time versus having it be uh, gambling. Well, how much money can I make today? Um, because, uh, you know, wealth takes time. You know, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Jack Bogle, uh, wealth is built over time and it's not built mm -hmm. overnight. Um, so uh, just, I, I, maybe I missed this question or maybe we didn't include it previously, but um, the question is, is there any downside to leaving your 401k at a previous employer? Um, and I think maybe they were looking for either, are there specific things that could be negatives that could occur by doing that? Yeah, I think um, just not having uh, professional guidance if you're not working with a financial advisor. And again, I would say just there's a limited number of investment options, right? So, you know, at Raymond James, I think we've got uh, 15 to 20 mutual funds that we can use. Again, if it's still within your employer-sponsored plan, there's going to be a limited, uh, limited number of investment options. Plus, when somebody wants to go to withdraw money and live off of that at retirement, uh, you're probably going to want to withhold some taxes from that, and uh, you're going to want to talk to a CPA or a financial advisor about, you know, tax implications and how much you should be withholding. So. Um, I think if you're, if you're investment savvy and financially savvy, uh, you know, you can do that. But I think for the lion's share of folks, um, it's, it's good to work with an advisor. Um, this question just came in uh, and says, I am 34 years old, got a bit of a late start, but I'm now maxing out my annual 401k contribution and maxing out my annual Roth IRA contribution. I have a pile of cash that isn't earning much in savings. What should I focus on next? Yeah, so here's somebody that, yeah, 34, uh, you know, I, I think that's still relatively young. So, so um, if, you're maxing out, <laughs> if you're maxing out your Roth in your, in your 401k, I think those are, those are uh, your first two big things. Then your emergency fund, enough in cash and checking, so it sounds like this person has plenty of cash. Uh, I have a lot of people calling me right now. Hey, I've got some extra money. I can't travel. I can't do anything. How about I send you some money and we'll buy some, you know, mutual funds, stocks, ETFs. And uh, I think, you know, for the next few years overall, the stock market is, is presents some good opportunities, but the market is, is getting uh, expensive. And I think it's, it's a little bit uh, frothy right now. And I just think people should really pay attention to valuations of, of stocks and mutual funds. But for this person with their question, I would also um, make sure that they're debt-free, that they have everything paid off. And will they need some of that cash as a down payment on a home, a new car, a lease on a car? Uh, I think it's, you know, use that cash wisely. Uh, you want to be careful uh, not to invest it right now. Sometimes people think, well, I'm not getting paid anything in my savings and checking. I want to make some money on there. But if you're going to need that money in, you know, 12 to 24 months, I would keep it in cash. Okay, great. Um, so I just, uh, there's a question is, uh, the question is, is maxing out your limit, and I'm going to assume they mean your 401k or I, Roth IRA limit at an earlier age better than saving it for when entering a higher income bracket to generate tax savings on contributions? Um, Todd, give me another swipe at that. Okay. So Read is that it, back to me again. Is maxing out your limit at an earlier age better than saving it for when entering higher income bracket to generate uh, tax savings on contribution. Yeah. So one of the um, links or spreadsheets that Carolyn's going to share with everybody today is, is a budget worksheet and also this financial statement. That So I think it really goes back to answering the question, um, what 
what chapter of life are you in, right? If you're a student just getting out of, of your undergrad, you're probably going to need more cash uh, for figuring out where you're going to live, right? Buying that first car, upgrading your car. If you're more uh, close, let's, let's say you're closer to retirement or you're in your mid-50s, um, you're within a 10, 15-year runway of retirement, um, you know, I think you can, you can invest more, right? You still have time to invest. So I think it goes back to what chapter of life am I in as far as a financial chapter? And is, what does my budget say, you know? Uh, because I think based on the financial chapter you're at in your life, it's going to be different for, for different people. Okay. Very good. So I think this is going to be our last question. And it's, uh, it looks like there's not much we can do for us older people. Uh, what can we do to jump into investing at an older age? So yeah, this might be applicable to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that, that, uh, that hair makes you look young, Todd, like me. So you're not old. Yeah, right. I, I, I think I saw that was me. That was maybe uh, Hardy's question. So yeah, we're never too young or too old to invest. But um, yeah, I, I think for um, uh, somebody that's a little more seasoned, uh, shall we say, uh, I think you've, you've got to look and see, um, you know, what is the, what's the smartest use of my capital, right? Is the smartest use of my capital uh, to build up that emergency fund? Is it to uh, pay off a high interest credit card? Is it to pay off a loan on a car? Is it to pay down my mortgage quicker uh, because we've had this big run up in stocks? Um, so maybe I pay, pay a little extra on my mortgage. We know that a, if we just make an extra payment a year on a 30 year mortgage, you'll pay it off seven or eight years earlier by making one extra payment a year. Uh, but I think if you, if you have those boxes checked, once again, I think um, buying a couple good dividend stocks, you know, uh, I like dividend stocks. Um, you know, if you, if you pay yourself two or 3% a year in dividend and the company uh, can still grow, you know, maybe they grow 4% a year, you get a 3% dividend, that's 7% that's a year. So I think a total return perspective, uh, buying a good growth and income mutual fund or uh, large cap dividend stock. I think that makes a lot of sense, even for a, a more seasoned investor. Okay. Well, Eric, uh, on behalf of the Sanford Center and uh, myself, thank you very much for being with us today. So I'll turn it over to Carolyn. And I just wanna say thank you too. Thanks to both of you, um, Eric, for taking the time to share your expertise. And Todd, you know I couldn't have done this without your help. So. Thank you to you and your expertise as well. Um, and we really appreciate the partnership with the Sanford Center. And uh, Eric, thanks also for the homework. For alumni, we won't, we won't grade your homework. Um, and I don't know if these guys believe me, but I'm gonna do some of the homework. So I am not a student, but I certainly can always use a little investment and retirement and budgeting homework. So um, hopefully you all found this enjoyable and educational, if nothing else, and helpful. I know that I did. So um, to our alumni, thanks to all of you for joining us today. And we are planning on doing um, some different types of chats and events like this. So we hope that you can join us for those as well. And I won't kick anyone off, but I am gonna stop recording at this point. So thanks to everyone, all of you for being here and teaching us and go Broncos. Yeah.